Well, as I uh, most often do, I want to begin as I most often do, and that is to say to you personally, welcome, man, welcome. It's so good to have you. Welcome, those of you uh, who are watching this on any of our sites. I want you to know you're in our hearts, you're in our minds, you're in our prayers. And for those of you who are watching online, wherever you are, whether you're locally or uh, nationally or globally, wherever you are, we, uh, we also appreciate your presence. Uh, it's good to be together. I want to say uh, just a couple things about that video. First off, I had nothing to do with that video. It felt really weird for me sitting down here. I saw that in a run through this week and it was already like done. And uh, I just need to say that, but I do want to explain a couple things that I think are interesting about that story. Um, so I was meeting with, uh, I didn't realize they were bald, uh, but I was meeting with a group of pastors from um, Australia. And so it was on a Friday afternoon, it was right over here, Friday morning, if I recall. And as I saw her and you know, everything she said, and um, she, I, as I recall, she said, I, can you tell me about the church? And so I said, sure, well, let me, and then walked her down there. And anyway, long story short, uh, got to know her later, and um, she gave her life to Jesus. And as she said, her husband, Tim, and her kids and was baptized. Uh, Lynn has baptized more people in this church, probably than any staff person. She has been so incredibly involved in helping people to find Jesus. And often when we do these uh, day baptisms where we you know, kind of open it up, she's in the back, she's cheerleading, and she's making a huge difference. But um, I tell you all that to say this. <clears throat> if you don't think God can change your life, you need to meet Lynn. And you need to get to know who she is, and you need to get to know her heart, um, because she has uh, fallen in love with Jesus, and everyone that she comes in contact with knows that about her. And... She has grown. She, in fact, today uh, sits on our board uh, as a church. She is an incredible leader. And I'm just telling you, don't ever discount what God can do. And he can do it in you. And uh, what she did was she opened herself up to his leadership, and that's what happened. So, all right, with all of that said, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. We're in a series, as you already know, it's called All In Together. And uh, I'm not going to wear this shirt every week, but I'm wearing it again today. And I'm doing this because I want, to put, I want to make sure you get this vision in front of your eyes and that you understand what's going on. So uh, we as a church are uh, trying to do something. Let me say it this way. I asked you a couple of weeks ago. I said, listen, um, what, what percent of your capacity as a person do you think you've developed? In other words, are, are you anywhere close to what you are capable of? And then I, I just simply said, are you okay with that? You know? Yeah, I'm at 50%, I'm at you know, 70%, I'm at 20%. What, what, when your life is over, are you going to be okay with that's all you did? All right, now again, I'm not passing judgment, I'm just asking. But then I asked a question about a church. How, what, what's our capacity as a church? What percentage of our capacity as a church are you think we're hitting? And um, I don't know how you answered that, but I've got to tell you honestly as your pastor, I, I, don't, I don't think we're hitting anywhere near our capacity. And... Um, so as I've wrestled with that, I've just thought, we've, we, I'm not okay with that. And, and I, I want to make you not okay with that, all right? Uh, I, I want to say this. I want you to understand this, and this I think is really important. I think that everything you have was given to you by God. Now, you might disagree with that. That's okay. I just think everything I have was given to me by God. Everything you have was given to you by God, which, which means that everything that you call yours uh, is on loan to you from him. So you have some time on your hands and that's from him. You have some energy. You have some talent. You have some abilities. You have a spiritual gift or two. Uh, you have financial resource. Everything you have uh, is on loan to you from God. And again, I believe this with everything in me. And uh, most of the things that you think were given to you for you were not given to you for you. They were given to you for him, for you to use so you have something to contribute to something bigger than you, make your life count for something. Um, so the truth of the matter is, is that a lot of people, and I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad, but I just got to, I'm going to call some things out here. A lot of people, the only time they ever give to God is one hour on a weekend uh, in church. That's it. That is not why you were given time. That was not the point that you would sit and listen to some talking head for an hour and call it good. I also want you to understand this. And again, I'm going to say this boldly and bluntly of um, all the people who call Central Home. And we're talking thousands upon thousands, if you don't know this, Okay. More than half the people who go to Central do not contribute anything financially. I, I might be talking to you. I, I need you to understand something. When you're not in the game, you hurt all the rest of us. And, and we're not reaching our capacity because you, you won't get out of the stands and get onto the field. I, I just need you to understand if that's you, I'm coming for you. Unashamedly. I'm, you're missing out. 
You were not given all of that just for your sake. You can certainly be blessed by it, but it was not the reason you have all that. So we as a church are asking ourselves some hard questions about our future and what can we do? What should we do? Where should we go? And uh, what difference could we make? So anyway, let's just hold that for a second. And if you think that's the most offensive thing I'm going to say today, you don't hang on. Okay, it's going to get better, all right? Okay, so take your Bibles, go to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, and we'll be there in just half a second, but I need you to take a moment to find it. Matthew chapter 1 is the first book in the New Testament, so you just find that book and just kind of stick your finger in there and hold that for that just for a moment. So last week we began a discussion uh, all in together, and we were talking about legacy. And we were trying to give you some, you know, we talked about eulogies and epitaphs and what those are, but we said the greatest thing you're going to, the greatest difference you're going to make is going to be in your legacy. And then we're going, okay, well, what does a legacy mean? So I gave you a couple of ways to think about it. Let me just review that and remind you of it. Your legacy is the difference your life made to those who came after you. Now, it's kind of a weird thing because you're still here, but somebody's coming after you. If Jesus Christ doesn't return, somebody's coming after you. And the difference is, the question is, what difference did you make? Did, is anyone going to be better because you were here now? And I, I can't answer that, but I think you should think about that. And then I wrote this because a lot of us think, well, my legacy, that's way down the road. You know, I don't, I can't even think about that because that's, that's going to be written way after I die. No, 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 no. As so I put this idea out there, your legacy is not written when you die. It's written every day you live. When you die, they're going to hit the button save and your legacy is done. It, it's, it's not going to be altered. It's not going to be improved. It's not going to be better. It's just done. It's saved. So, Thinking about legacy is not something that you should never give any thought to. You should be like, what difference do you want your life to make? Now, I illustrated this last week through a character in the Bible, um, a guy by the name of Abraham. Now, again, I don't know what you know or don't know about Abraham. I need you to understand Abraham is absolutely one of the most important people in the Bible. He's one of the most important people on the planet that had ever lived. Now, you might not know him. You might not understand anything about him. He's known as the father of the Jewish nation. Let's start there. He's a patriarch. Uh, he, he is um, the person that three major world religions that encompass most people on the planet, by the way, trace their heritage to. The Jewish faith does, the Christian faith, and the Islamic faith all go back to Abraham. So when I say he's incredibly important, I'm just telling you he's worth a few moments of your time to think and figure out, like, what, what made this guy so special? What was his deal? Um, and so last week I introduced you to him and I said he had a son, his name was Isaac. And then um, I talked about the fact that he, he created a lineage of, of which included David, which ultimately led to Jesus. Now I wanna show you something that maybe you have never seen and never noted before, but I'm gonna try to make it make sense to you. If you have ever just said, I'm gonna read the Bible, you probably started in one of two places. You probably started in Genesis, which went great until you got to the book of Leviticus, right? And then you're like, I'm lost, right? Or you started in Matthew, because Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. You started in Matthew, and you started reading, and all of a sudden, all you got were a bunch of names of dead people. And you're like, what is this? So let me just show you something that I hope makes sense to you now. So in Matthew chapter 1, which I asked you to turn your Bible, Matthew, and always bring a Bible. Just bring a Bible. It'll always go better for everybody. Bring a Bible. Matthew chapter 1, I want to just read to you a couple of passages, okay? So let me find it in, in my Bible here, and then I'll, uh, I'll just show you something you, you've probably never seen. See it now, all right? So first verse of the New Testament, the first book of the New Testament, first verse of that book. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Okay, now look down at verse two. Abraham was the father of Isaac. The story of Jesus begins with Abraham. That's what it's trying to show you. Abraham was the father of Isaac. That's that boy that was born to this couple, all right? And if you keep going down, look down at verse six. And Jesse, we're, we're, I'm skipping a bunch of names, going through generations. And Jesse was the father of King David, all right? So now we're going to pause. King David, the greatest king Israel ever had. David was the father of Solomon, and we're off to races again. You get down to verse 11. Uh, and Josiah was the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. 
Now, the exile to Babylon is when the Babylonians came, captured the Israelites, hauled them off, and it was kind of like a pause. And then the story picks back up, okay, uh, after the exile to Babylon, and then we pick up Jeconiah. And then I want you to go down to verse 16, and it says, and Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who was called the Messiah. Thus, there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Now, I told you every blessing you have in Jesus, you owe to Abraham. Because God called Abraham, and, and Abraham had to make a decision about what he was going to do. Now, I want to explain something. Abraham to David, David to Jesus, to the exile, exile to Jesus. Abraham to Jesus. Okay, that's the route. I want to explain to you four things, four avenues uh, in how God works. And, and I, I could preach a sermon on this point I'm going to make right now. I'm only going to say this now, but I want you to understand something. God works through four avenues. And, and I just want you to note them. Okay, four avenues. God works through plans. He works through purposes. He works through people. And he works through promises. Make sure you know them. Plans, purposes, people, and per, um, uh, promises. That is how he's always worked. It's how he's worked in my life. It's how he's worked in your life. Uh, God, God is, not, see, you might look at your life and you think you're just totally random. You're, you're just a, a person that just ended up on the planet. You were just, a, you know, a, your mom and dad, you know, one night. That's what happened. No, that's not how God works. And God has more in store for you. you, you are, you're not random. You think it's a coincidence? You think it's just happened to be 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile, 14 from the exile to Jesus, just random? You think things just happen randomly in your life? That just, yeah, just coincidence, a lot of coincidence. Do you ever think maybe there's more to that? Now, I want to go back to the beginning because Abraham is so important. I want to show you something that I did not show you last week. I intentionally skipped the part I want to show you right now. See, last week I introduced you to Abraham, and I, I basically said God made, made a promise to Abraham. If you'll, you know, it's going to be, a, we're going to call it a covenant. He, he made a covenant, and, and I showed it to you. It's in Genesis chapter, uh, Genesis 12, first book of the Bible. Genesis 12. So we're at the beginning of the beginning, okay? Genesis 12. And it's verses one to four. Let me show him. Let me read them to you again. Again, bring a Bible. You can read along. All right. Genesis 12, one to four. The Lord said to Abram, and Abram and Abraham, same guy, different eras of his life. Abram at first, God changed it to Abraham. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That's a promise, all right? So Abram left as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Now, what we talked about last week was the blessing. God said, I'm gonna do all this incredible stuff. And uh, Abram had to process all that. But what I wanna do is I wanna show you something it was contingent upon. And we don't think about this, but I need you to see this. I want you to look at the first three words that came out of God's mouth to Abram. They're very important. Leave your country. You, you see it right there? The Lord has said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go. Whoa, whoa what, what do you mean leave my country, my father, my, my uh, whoa, whoa, what's it? What does his country represent to him? Well, probably the same thing your country represents to you. What, 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 what do you mean? What, what's my country? Everything Abraham knew, everything he valued, the root of all his successes, the place of all his memories, all of that, all that, he, all that his life was about was in his land. And God says, I want you to walk away from that. Let, let me say it to you in a different way. God said to Abraham, leave everything that gives you security behind and go where I tell you to go. Now, wait a minute. Okay, hang on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Leave everything that gives me security. Yeah, leave it all behind. And it's as if God was saying to Abraham, now listen carefully, this is important, okay? Abram, you're just gonna have to trust me on this. You're just gonna have to trust me on this. Just go with me on this. 
You can be okay if you do. I, I want you to understand something. This is the same dilemma you and I face every single day we live. God's going, you're just going to need to trust me on this. And we're going, eh, I don't know about that. Um, I, I want to just put yourself in Abraham's place for just a second. And again, Abraham, Abraham, same guy. Put yourself in his place. What would you have done? Because you're being faced with it right now. Be honest. What would you do? Would you go? Would you stay? Would you negotiate with God? Would you counteroffer? Would you debate? Would you argue? Would you walk away? Would you do it but just have a heart of resentment? What would you do? I want you to... Uh, I want you to understand what God, your relationship with God is exactly like the relationship you as a parent had with your little kid when he was a little kid. And I, 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 I'm imagining every parent in life has had this experience. I, I don't know. I, I know I certainly have. But the experience of when you're in a pool and your son or your daughter is on the edge of the pool and you're doing everything you can do to get them to jump. And you're saying everything that makes any sense to you. Oh, honey, come on. I I got gotcha. you. Come on, trust me. Jump. Honey, I would never hurt you. I would never let you drown. Just jump. And then you see the hesitancy of your kid. Just, uh. And by the way, you know what's going through your kid's mind? Everything you've ever said to him before, him or her, they're weighing all of that. How have you been in the past? The last time you said, trust me, pull my finger. Your kid's going, no. No, but have you lied to your kid? Have you done stuff that causes your kid to go, no. I know you pranked me last time. I was so sorry I listened to you last time. Your character is put on the spot there. You're saying, jump, just trust me. But here's the deal. To jump, to trust, don't miss this, implies the surrender of your control of the situation. That's where we're uncomfortable. Listen, all risk, uh, all trust involves risk. All trust involves risk. If there's no risk, there's no need to trust. And your kid's weighing, is it worth the risk? You're weighing right now with God, is it worth the risk? And I can't answer that for you. I can answer that for me. But here's what I want you to understand. This is the big idea of the message today. Only, only, only in trusting God can we overcome our fears. I can't tell you to overcome your fears. I can't, but I can tell you the way you overcome your fears is you get God bigger than your fear. You let God be more than that thing you're afraid of. Only in God can we overcome our fears. That's just the way it works. And it's the big idea. Now, let me show you what Abraham did. So God said, leave your country. Now look at verse four. I read it, but I see you, don't, you maybe didn't see it. Verse four, first three words. So Abram left. Well, what's the big deal about Abram? Because God said, leave your country. So Abram left. So Abram left. As the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. I'll tell you more about Lot in weeks to come. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He was 75. And God said, you're going to have to trust me on this. He overcame his fears. The, the great news about the story of Abraham, if you know the story, is that when God said that to him, I want you to leave your country, and Abraham left, God never, ever again tested him or put his faith, you know, on trial. He never, ever asked anything more than that of Abraham. That's the great part. And that's absolutely 100% not true. The easiest thing God ever asked Abraham to do was leave your country. And, and, and then God said, okay. That's a great start. Uh, let me show you just a couple. I'll, I'll do these quick. I'm going to show you just. See, God says, I want you to go where I'm leading you. Now, listen, follow me, and I'm going to take you somewhere. He took him to a place called Canaan, and he basically said, see all this? Uh, it's going to, well, let me just read it to you, okay? This is Genesis 12, just right where we are. The next verse, so Abram left, verse 5. Um, he, took Sarah, he took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated, and all the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem, 
At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I'm going to give this land. Now, let's back up a minute. Let's just remember something. He's 75 years old. He has no kids. He's in Canaan now. All of these people, the Canaanites are all there. And God says, hey, I just want you to know that you and your descendants are going to have this land, the land we today know as Israel. It's going to be your land. And uh, Abram's got to be going, okay, let me, let me just do a quick summation here. I got, I got my nephew Lot. We got some people, servants, and we got some some donkeys, and we got some camels. And we're supposed to run out all of this. Yeah, we're going to call this the promised land. Because how does God work? Plans, purposes, people, and promises. I'm going to give you this. And he's going, oh, okay. Here's what you need to understand. God, God you got to, you got to, that would be really risky to try to take this land. And God would have said, I know. Just, Abraham, you're going to just have to Trust me on this. It's going to be your land. Well, good, that's the last test. There'll be nothing else. No, actually, um, remember last week what I talked about? I just got to review it real quick. Uh, God comes to Abram and says, I want you to go and I want you to, you know, trust me on this because you're going to become the father of a nation. And, and I said, you and I would have tripped up on the of a nation. He tripped up on the of, you're going to be a father because he, he was at the time 75, had no kids. Now follow this. He's 75, he has no kids. His wife at that point is 65. He's 75, then he's 80, then he's 85, then he's 90, and he still has no kids. And God said, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you this land and uh, you're gonna have, you know how many failed pregnancy tests they went through in all those years? Well, How did Abraham handle it? Now listen carefully. This is going to get real. In in Genesis 17, verses 15 to 18, God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings and peoples will come from her. Abraham fell face down. He laughed and he said to himself, will a son be born born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? 95 came, 96, 97, 98, 99. More failed pregnancy tests, nothing. So he laughed. Now you could go, see, he had no faith. Okay, at some point you got to give it to Abraham going, okay, come on, guys, try him right? Let me say something. If you have ever sat with a couple that's suffering from infertility, and I have, if you've ever sat with a couple who's suffering and they're going, why God? Why? That's what, there's two emotions that are incredibly dominant, fear and anxiety. Fear and anxiety. I'm afraid. And what are you afraid? It will never happen What are you anxious about? What if it never happens? When you're suffering in that moment, the hardest thing to do is believe in the possibilities of something when you haven't built such a logical case against the possibility of something. How many years have we tried? How much have we spent? It's as if God was saying to Abraham at 99, and Sarah at 89 at the time. Guys, you're just going to have to trust me on this. You're just going to have to trust me on this. Well, again, spoiler alert. He was 100 years old. A little bun in the oven. 100 years old, they have a baby. They name him Isaac. You go, oh man, finally, you have arrived. There's no more need to trust God. Oh, no. The greatest thing yet to come is about to happen. I, I, I'm not going to go into any detail on this today. I'll pick this up in weeks to come. But um, this baby is born. His name's Isaac, and he's growing up, man. He's growing up, and he's becoming a young, strapping young man. And, and we don't know exactly when. Sometime maybe around the age of 10. We don't know. Uh, God comes to him, and what he, God's going to ask him to do. If you're new to this, this is going to sound like the, the most bizarre, outlandish, cruel 
insensitive, whatever, okay? Trust me. Wait, that's what God would say. Trust me, I got a reason for this. God's gonna ask him to do something with that 10-year-old boy, and it's shocking. And it's not what it appears. But let me show you what, what it appears. This is what he says. And this is Genesis uh, 22, 2. Then God said, Abram, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. What? Yeah, take your son, your only son, and I want you to go. Now, he said go to Moriah. You, it mean nothing to you. You know where Moriah is? Moriah is a mountain that's currently located in a city that grew up around it called Jerusalem. Mount Moriah is where the temple was built. I want you to take your son, your only son, and I want you to go there, and I want you to sacrifice him. And Abraham's going, I got, like, God, you got to be kidding. I'm 110 now. Have you seen Sarah lately? She's 100. It was 10 years ago she gave birth the last time. How in the world am I? And God says, you're just going to have to trust me on this. Now, here's, here's what he didn't know that you do know. This was all setting up Jesus because in the lineage from Abraham to Jesus, God's going to give his son his one and only son as a sacrifice for somebody else. And God's working through plans, working through people, working through purposes, working through promises. That's what he does. He's just going to have to trust me on this, setting up the future of his only son, what he's going to do. Folks, only trusting God can we overcome our fears. Now, let me, let me make this. I want to get this really down. I want to nail this down, all right? I want to say this. What's the difference between faith and trust? If, if, if I were to ask around, uh, if I were to ask around, do you have faith in God? A lot of people would say, I have faith in God. But then I, if I ask the question, do you trust God? All of a sudden, wait, no, no, no. Wait, I don't have the same. No, I have faith, but I don't have trust. Can you have faith and not have trust? Can you say you trust, but not have faith? Let me give you the definitions of these two words, all right? You can look them up. Here's the definition of trust. Reliance on the integrity, strength, ability, surety of a person or thing, confidence in. That's trust. You know what the definition of faith is? Confidence or trust in a person or thing. Hey, those sound identical. Yeah, you know why? Because they're pretty much identical. You know what God says? Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. Don't try to figure this thing out the way you think it would work. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he's going to sort it out. That's what it means. He's going to make your path straight. He's going to work it out. Put your trust in him. Have faith in God. And it'll work out. And, and then this passage, remember from Hebrews eleven six, 6. We talked about this last summer. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because you can't please God if you don't believe he exists. And if you don't believe he exists, you'll never turn to him. You'll never trust him. He's going to reward those who seek him. Now listen, to have faith is to have trust. Have trust. Don't tell me you have faith in God, but you don't trust him. You don't have faith. And they're not the same. Now, it doesn't mean there's no fear doesn't mean there's no doubt, doesn't mean there's no questionings, doesn't mean there's no concern, doesn't mean any of that. But here's the dilemma. Here's the dilemma. And, I, and again, let's get personal. You tell me you have faith in God, and I say, oh, so you're, you're confident that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. And many people would say, absolutely. I believe in God. I have faith. I trust God that he's got salvation worked out for me. That's awesome. Um, so you trust him for your salvation. That's a, that's a great. How about with your fears? Do you trust him with your fears? Oh, yeah, for the most part. I mean, I still let fear, you know, kind of gets big. Do you trust him for your fears? Well, you know, I'm, now catch this. Don't, I'm assuming this on purpose. Okay, do you trust him with your money? Oh, no, 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 no. I trust him for salvation, but I don't trust him with my money. 
It's really an interesting thought. Pull out the coin you were handed when you walked in here. Um, this, by the way, is a real dollar, just so you know. Don't chuck it in the trash can on your way out. Okay, it's a real dollar. It's not a prop. It's not a fake. It's not a plug nickel. It's not a thing out of a electrical box. Remember those who play with? No, it's a real. It's a dollar. I want you to find on that, and they come on different places on different ones of these. Sometimes they're in the bottom, and they're very hard to see. Like this one I've got right here, underneath James Buchanan is on his on this dollar. It says four words. What are those four words? In God we trust. In God we trust. So I want to ask you, just kind of look at that and ask yourself the simple question, is that true for you? The ACLU hates the fact that these four words are on your coin. They want them gone. But it's interesting that in our currency, in our country, it, to this day, it still says, in God we trust. In God we trust. Do you? The... Uh, the truth of the matter is many of us miss it by about that much. Miss the truth about. Let me explain to you the three M's of distrust. It's supposed to be in God we trust, but the first M is in me I trust. That's the first M. In me I trust. Give me this, I'll do something. I'm in me, I have confidence in me. In me I trust. The second M of distrust is in money I trust. In this God I trust. In me I trust, in money I trust, and the third M is in more I trust. I trust in more. I'll do everything to get more money for me. And God going, hey, well, slow down here. In God, I, I trust. Can I just say, there's only three things you can do with this, just so you know. Every other thing, I'm going to give you the three ones. You, every, every other thing is a variant of these three. And they go increasingly difficultly in degrees of difficulty. The, the first and easiest thing you can do with this is spend it, right? It's the easiest thing of all. Just go, you go spend it. You go, no, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to gamble it. No, that's just spending it. You're spending it. You can spend it. The second thing, it's harder. It's to save it. You could save it. You can say, I'm not going to spend it. I'm going to set it aside. I'm going to save it. That's hard. A lot of people don't do that. They just spend everything they get. The hardest thing you can do with this is give it. Those are the three things. No, no, no. I'm going to invest it. No, that's saving. You're saving. You're setting it aside for the future. You're either using it now, setting it aside for the future, or you're dedicating it to another purpose while you're yet alive. Those are the three possibilities of what you can do. I want to take you to a passage that... Uh, can cause you a lot of heartburn, okay? But I want to show you something. This comes from the book of Malachi. Malachi was an Old Testament prophet, and uh, this is what God said to Malachi to tell us, okay? Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. No, you stop. I'm lost. Because I go to church, and they talk about tithes and offering, and I keep thinking they want my necktie. Not tithes, tithe. What is a tithe? It's a word for a tenth. God says, bring a tenth into the storehouse. And what we would know as the church, bring a tenth. Dedicate a tenth. Okay, but let me show you. Bring the whole tithe, not half of it, not a fourth of it, not a portion of it. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. Let me translate. Y'all are just going to have to trust me in this. That's what God's saying. T test me in this. You're just, yeah, you're just going to have to trust me on this. Bring a tenth. Trust me on this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Trust me. Test me on this. Put me to the test. And uh, remember last week I told you from the prophet Haggai? He said, hey, um, people, have you ever noticed that you have holes in your purses? Your pockets can't hold anything? You ever notice that? And I said, why don't you reflect on maybe why that is? Why can you not get ahead? God was saying to Haggai, would you get my people to trust me again? Would you get my people to see what they're doing? 
And here he just says, hey, you're going to have to trust me on this. Set aside a tenth. Now, see, we want to protest. We want to go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's mine. Well, no. Everything you have is from God on loan to you. And God says, I want you to dedicate a tenth of that. This is our problem. This is our issue. Okay? Now, what is this all in about? Again, I explained this last week. Let me just run it quickly, all right? Um, we're, we're trying to learn how to trust God with all things. And we're trying to learn how to trust God for greater things. Now, I explained all of this, in, well, we explained this, I didn't, in this book. And if you didn't get one last week, please pick one up on your way. Just go look through it. Just wrestle with it. There's a place for notes for the sermon. There's a place for uh, devotions. There's an explanation of what we're doing. But, but see, basically what we're trying to do is um, we're trying to increase the faithfulness of our church in trusting God. See, see, the problem is, and I already explained it, but the problem is we have way too many people sitting up in the bleachers watching people and just going, and, and by the way, you tend to be really critical when you're in the bleachers and not on the field. Like, do that better. Why did you get on the field? Help us do that better. Part of the reason we can't do better is because we don't have you on the field. But, but basically what happens is, is the people love to sit and criticize instead of get out there and make a difference. So we basically have identified some ministries that we believe our church was called to make a difference and we're basically saying, let's make a difference in this stuff. And we then have added up and go, what would it take resource-wise? And, and this might shock you, okay? This might shock you, but here's what I need you to understand, all right? With the people who are faithful in their giving in our church, and again, this is across all of our campuses online, here's what happens. If nothing happens in the next two years and just what normally happens, happens, you all are going to give about $33 million uh, in the next, uh, that's incredible, okay? Well, yes, except when you start to realize how large Central is, you start to realize that's really not, and like I said, more than half don't give anything, so this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to raise an additional $23 million. We're trying to raise $56 million over the next two years, which if we don't do anything, we're going to have 33, then you might be going, $23 million more? You've got to be crazy, Pastor. I need you to understand something. I'm not the crazy one. I'm not the crazy one. We're not asking, hey, let's give a quarter of a billion dollars over the next two years. No, no, no. You think for one moment God hasn't resourced us with an additional $23 million? That's not the issue. It's not that God wasn't faithful. It's not that God didn't trust us. It's that we are holding on to what, folks, $23 million in a church's size is peanuts. The problem is, is they're our peanuts. They're not God's peanuts. And I just need you to understand, you're going to a church as a pastor, number one, it's getting close to retirement, so I really don't care anymore about offending people. It sucks to be you. <laughs> Meaning I'm just going to tell it the way it is. <clears throat> but the second thing is I've lived it, and I want it for every one of you. And there was no way I could get up here and say the things I say if I'm not living the life I'm taught, if I'm not eating my own cooking. So here's what I need you to understand. We could do this. God's given us the resource. The question is, is are, are we going to be found faithful? I want to close this message, and we'll just close this installment of the series. I want to tell you a true story. It happened in the summer of 1859. I've got to go back in time. 1859. And um, it's a story about a man who is incredibly brave, very brave, very willing to take risks. And his name was Charles Blondin, but because the camera, and you might not know this, the camera was invented in 1816, this happened in 1859, so we actually have a picture of him. This is the man I'm going to tell you about. Charles Blondin was a famous tightrope walker and um, world famous. And in the summer of 1859, he stretched a cable across Niagara Falls, 160 feet up above the falls. And he, um, I mean, literally, the, the water was crashing on the edge right below him, 160 feet up. And people came from all around because it was obviously going to be something incredible to watch. And to the applause of thousands and thousands of people who came to observe what he could do, he walked across he would come back and he would say things like, you know, this, this really is not hard. He said, let me make it a little more challenging. So they blindfolded him and he walked across and he walked back. You know, that's really not hard. He rode a bicycle there and back. They really not hard. Most, one of his most famous ones was he went out and took a stove in the middle of the falls and cooked an omelet. 
And he came back, and then one day, he walked across the falls. He said, let me do something a little more challenging. He walked across the falls backwards. And then he went to the Canadian side, and then he came back to the American side. But when he came back, he, he came back, he was pushing a wheelbarrow. He was pushing a wheelbarrow on the line, and he gets to the American side. I think, oh, crazy. This guy is amazing. And then he said, you know what? Uh, you know, it's really not hard. It's really not that hard. He says, let me, let me do something that will challenge me. He goes, how many of you believe that I can walk across this cable? I'll, I'll go forward, though. I'll go forward. I'll put the wheelbarrow in front of me, and I'll push this wheelbarrow over to the Canadian side. How many of you believe I can do this with a person in the wheelbarrow? And the crowd went berserk, clapping and cheering and egging them on. Blondin, blond, we believe, we believe, go for it, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And then you know where this is going to go. He said, that's awesome. I need a volunteer. <laughs> End of story. End of story. You see, while you stand on your own two feet, don't say you trust in God. Because until you're willing to put your life on the line for him, and you believe in his ability to sustain your life, to sustain your family, to sustain your future on this earth, you don't trust them. You say you do. We go, Pastor, why are you so intense today? Folks, all I'm talking about is money. That's all I'm talking about that we're so possessed by. Why won't we let go? It's only money. What do you think you're going to do with it? Where do you think you're taking it? Famously, Charles D. Rockefeller, or uh, John D. Rockefeller, when he died, richest man in America, standard oil, uh, kerosene, if you know the story, richest man, he dies, people gather around, a guy leans over, he sees uh, 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 Rockefeller's accountant, he leans over to Rockefeller's accountant, he says, how much did he leave? And the accountant leaned back and he said, all of it. <laughs> Folks, what do you think you're going to leave? Something less than all of it? Your legacy is going to be you left all of it? For somebody else? Do you never? How about you think ahead? What if you left it while you were here to do something significant before the story's saved and it's over? What if you did that? Jim Elliott died. He was a pastor. He died at the hands of the Aka Indians in uh, South America. And they, people tried to talk him, don't do it, don't go, don't go. And he said, they'll kill you. And Jim Elliott famously said these words, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. What do you think you're going to keep? What do you stand to lose? Only in trusting in God. Only in trusting in God can we overcome our fears. Do you trust him? Last thing I want to say, the dollar that you were given, um, I want to ask you to do something with this, and I've only done this since Thursday night, and it's been uh, very interesting. I want to encourage you to put this in a place where you'll see it or touch it. I've been carrying it in my pocket, and every time I reach in my pocket, I feel that. Every time you see or touch this coin over the next four weeks until we're done with this series, I want you to ask yourself the simple question, am I trusting in God? Am I trusting in God? Just let it just be a touch point to remind you to think about, are you trusting in God? And if you're not, what are you trusting in? Where's your faith? Where's your confidence? What do you believe? What do you believe? Now, I'm going to pray. Our campus uh, pastors will close out, and then we'll wrap it up. Come back next week. It's just going to get more intense. I'm just telling you. We have only yet begun. Let's pray. God, thank you for our time together. Thanks for this church. And, and uh, God, just thanks for the challenge of getting our priorities. We don't reflect enough. We don't think deep enough. God, we're all destined to die and, uh, unless you return. And uh, it's going to be suddenly and unannounced or it's going to be slowly. I don't know. But I do know that today... Right now, we're alive and we're breathing and we can make some decisions about what's important and what's not. And we can make some plans to change, to do something different. 
God, thanks for the ways you work, the avenues you work in our lives. Our lives are not random. It's very, very much overseen by you. God, help us to put our faith in you. And I, I do pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.